welcome back for another episode of Cannon Fodder, and God, what an episode this week. The meatiest we've had in quite a while. As promised, we're diving further into the content coming from the Infinity's Armory update later this month, so let's dive in. We open with a look at the two new maps we'll be getting. First is the new arena map, Riptide. The created have wasted no time in extending their influence across inhabited worlds, burrowing into forerunner machines and UNSC information systems to turn terraforming equipment and world engines to their own grand designs. Unbound by the limited foresight of mortals, the agents of Cortana can reshape worlds into verdant gardens teeming with life after only a few decades of manipulation, but at much short-term cost. Scarred by wars both ancient and new, the created have judged this planet to be in need of significant remediation and remodeling, shifting continents and oceans after the AI constructs carefully balanced the drawbacks and benefits of both limited extinction events and damage to the existing colonial infrastructure. So, that's pretty interesting. Our first look at what Cortana and the created are up to following the end of Halo 5, it's only a peek, but to me it's very welcome. This notion of the AI terraforming worlds, using Forerunner tech to cut down on time, I have to wonder if this might explain Reach's seeming speedy recovery. I mean, here it is in 2557, 58 or so, and again in 2589. Quite the contrast for 31 years. Now it's true we don't know exactly how long the terraforming process originally took, but the description for Riptide seems to brag that it only takes a few decades with these Forerunner enhancements. Second up is the Warzone Assault map, Urban, based on the Battle of Noctis map released in December. In the aftermath of the Human Covenant War, the underlying fractures in humanity that had precipitated the insurrection once more became apparent. The dynamic combination of social engagement, reconstruction, and security operations was embarked by the UNSC to disrupt nascent rebel movements, contain extremist politicians, and deny the insurrection freedom of maneuver. The most difficult of these missions took place in the sprawling and densely populated metroplexes of such worlds as Andesia. Not a whole lot to talk about, it's fairly similar to what we got from the Battle of Noctis description. Nothing wrong with that, I'm just saying. Moving forward, we finally have some information on the Mark V Alpha. As many have guessed, this isn't meant to be the same Mark V we saw in CEA or Halo 4. The Mark V and its product improved variant, the Mark V-B, were the first Mjolnir armors to fully integrate shield emitters and sufficient computer power for an onboard smart AI. The Mark V Alpha is a highly configurable revamp of the original. It's unclear who requested an integration check for the Mark V helmet with the latest Gen 2 architecture, but engineers at Materials Group have been surprised by the Mark V Alpha's near parity with contemporary designs. Well, <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth. The Mark V Alpha is very strange, regardless of whether you're approaching it from a real-world or in-universe perspective, and I have to agree with the description. Who asked for this? I never asked for this. <laughs> After that, we have a new weapon that many fans have been anticipating, the successor to the needle rifle, the Blood of Suban. The weapon is the result of the combined talents of Silset and Oebrin Chava. The two always had a knack for optimizing weaponry. As we know, the San Shayum didn't look too kindly on unauthorized modifications, a fact both brothers secretly enjoyed. Their skills eventually landed them commissions. Silset took a commission at the Sacred Promissary where his knowledge of Subanese crystal was put to use. Pausing a moment, I have to wonder if Silset had a hand in the development of the Needle Rifle, as his commission date is never given. Oebrin, on the other hand, found himself at the Iru Iru Armory, where he helped drive lethal advancement for the Covenant Carbine and Beam Rifle. For Oebrin, I have to wonder if he had a hand in the redesign of the Beam Rifle. Remember, the one in the 343 games is a Type 27, while Bungie's featured the Type 50. Anyway, when the Great Schism broke out, you can likely guess that both brothers found themselves allied with the Arbiter. In the time to follow, the brothers dedicated themselves to producing a new weapon, the result being the Blood of Suban. The rifle's expertly crafted crystal shards and firing mechanism are currently being reviewed for use in other weapons. While it's sad that the weapon is aesthetically basically a reskin of the carbine, the lore behind it is certainly inspiring. Next up, we have some updates for fleet battles. Spartan Games revealed two new ships coming to the game. First up is the all-new Orion-class Assault Carrier. The carrier was created during the height of the insurrection as a way of directly supporting sustained ground operations and maintaining aerospace control over contested worlds, according to Spartan Games. This carrier featured once state-of-the-art technology that allowed it to produce fuel, spare parts, and in some cases, complete combat vehicles. They also featured cargo lighters and resource gatherers for troop and ship support, particularly in austere expeditionary environments. Based on what the description says, this technology sounds like a miniature version of the technology likely used to produce units in Halo Wars. The description does mention that the technology has a relation to that which was used in colony support ships, 
which Spirit of Fire once was, before being converted to a military vessel. During the Covenant War, many Orions were lost when they were used for desperate rearguard action over once rebellious colonies, sacrificing themselves to buy time for evacuations. Those that survived would later make up the core of long-range battle groups attempting to disrupt Covenant supply lines and staging areas. The second new ship is the RCS Armored Cruiser, first seen in Halo 4. This is one we've talked about before. It was built in the early days of S.H.I.E.L.D. technology and thus lacks the firepower and ability of more recent ship designs, notably the CCS-class battlecruiser that replaced it. And though many of these ships were recycled when the CCS was introduced, the RCS has seen a resurgence in the post-war era, notably due to its reliability and simplicity of operation. And the loss of vital resources for maintaining newer ships. That's a big one. Well, eventually I'll start collecting more fleet packs, and you can bet I'll be wanting to get my hands on these. The final section today is something you're definitely going to have to read for yourselves, a breakdown of how an armor design gets its lore, provided by Kenneth Peters, a franchise writer at 343 Industries. Using the Achilles armor as an example, we get a fairly in-depth look at what gets taken into consideration when writing the lore behind a piece of armor, or a weapon, or anything. That seemingly insignificant piece of flavor text that lore buffs like you and me eat up. While I'll briefly discuss some of the more important lore elements brought up, again, I encourage you to read the whole thing by yourself. It's a great behind-the-scenes piece that the likes of which lore fans are rarely treated to. So, one of the first things considered when writing up the lore behind a piece of armor, a map, a weapon, etc., is how it will fit in with the existing canon and descriptions. Such considerations include the diffusion and maturation of Mjolnir technology and standards. In essence, this is referring to the massive outsourcing of Mjolnir technologies and development following the end of the Covenant War and the initiation of the Spartan IV program. As an example, Kenneth cites the Mermillion armor seen in Halo Online. Designed by RKD Group, the production is outsourced to Corolla of Heavy Industries, and the BIOS is licensed from Applied Heuristics. Even Bereglichkeit Rüstungssystem, a company long involved with Mjolnir development, no longer controls every aspect of the production. This sort of thing can even be seen in Halo 5's campaign, where a leading Dortmund worker mentions the company supplying them with gel layers. Equipping a team to rehabilitate a glass planet means accounting for its extreme conditions. Uniforms have to deal with extreme cold surface temps, as well as the heat generated by drills. Leang Dortmund set us up with some UNSC-developed tech, gel layer they call it. Goes on under your clothes and keeps temperatures steady. This stuff is magic. Normalization of Neural Interfaces in the Population even in late 2552, neural interface installation was basically major surgery, as we see in the Halo of the Fall of Reach, when John had to go under to get his upgraded. By 2557, however, it's basically a quick outpatient clinical procedure. Further, high bandwidth interface paired with expert systems can be used to augment human ability, to the point that even a non-augmented person can utilize high-performance combat exoskeletons. This doesn't necessarily mean Mjolnir, mind you, but it's a step towards that. Now, people may recall a while back, Frankie stated that Spartan IV augmentations aren't quite as good as the ones given to the Spartan IIs, but that, barring experience and training, a Spartan IV in Mjolnir Gen 2 could theoretically go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Spartan II in Gen 1. Perhaps these high broadband interfaces are one reason for that. It could explain why Spartan IIs and Gen 2 Mjolnir don't seem to show any noticeable increase in ability, despite Gen 2 being able to bring a Spartan IV up to a Spartan II's level. Proliferation of Once Secret Human Augmentation Procedures This is the one I probably find most interesting. In short, private industries have been able, through a combination of legal and illegal means, to secure once secret information on Spartan augmentation procedures. However, their knowledge isn't quite as refined as the UNSC's, these private parties relying on highly invasive procedures with unknown side effects. Further, it seems the UNSC hasn't given much thought as to what will happen to Spartan IVs when they retire, as the majority of their augmentations are irreversible. Side note, who wants to see a privately created pseudo-Spartan as a mini-boss in a future Halo title? Main entry or otherwise. Fractures in the UNSC's military power. This one's pretty straightforward. The UEG is stretched thin, leading to megacorporations establishing business empires, often at the expense of the little guy. Of major interest is that, since these corporations already use smart AI in their high-level business intelligence and planning, many could become useful proxies for the created. Another interesting hint at what could happen going forward. Incorporation of alien technology into human industry. This one's pretty straightforward. Finally, syncretism and forerunner technology. This one's basically the same as the last topic, but on the Sankhili side. No longer restricted by the prophets, and seeing limited resistance from ancient cults abhorred by the use of forerunner technology, the Sankhili have been able to follow in the footsteps of humanity, often using human discoveries as springboards for their own advancements. 
So those are some of the larger story strings that get considered when writing new flavor text for weapons, armor, maps, etc, etc. And there's even more that Kenneth goes into as he describes the process for writing about the Achilles armor. Again, give the full thing a read, it's easily the highlight from this week's article. But with that, the main article comes to a close and we move on to the new universe entries. This week we have the M343A2 minigun or chain gun, the M80B multiple launch rocket system or missile launcher, the M555 electromagnetic launcher or gauss cannon, the Type 58 directed energy support weapon or plasma cannon, and the Z520 encounter mitigation system or splinter cannon. Starting off with the chain gun, the M343 <laughs> A2 is the latest iteration of the classic machine gun. While it still overheats like certain, but apparently not all, guns of old, it doesn't receive as much wear. Though capable of shooting new polymer cased and energetic propellant rounds, the UNSC has ordered existing stocks of older ammo to be used up first. The M80B missile launcher is the successor to the M79 and improves upon the M80 with a smart link function. Unlike previous iterations of the missile launcher, it seems this variant is meant to be detached for mobile use, perhaps a response to Spartans randomly ripping perfectly good turrets off their mounts. The M555 Gauss Cannon is a mix of classic human technology mixed with alien technology, though there has been a noted minimal difference between the power of the new M555 and the existing M68. The T-58 is the latest plasma cannon, succeeding the T-42 from Halo 2 and the T-52 from just about every other Halo game. These are often utilized by Ungoy, perfectly suited for their love of not dying. Higher ranking Ungoy are also trained in maintaining their weapons, though explosive mistakes are made. It is not uncommon for elites to lament the loss of important equipment and the stench of charred Ungoy. Interestingly, the T-42 model is noted as being almost heretical as they too closely encroach on the divine perfection of the Forerunners. Finally, we have the Splinter Cannon. Used during the Forerunner Flood War by soldier constructs and builder security, these turrets can be physically moved to the battlefield or teleported via translocation beam. Though only turret configurations have been encountered, it is possible that vehicle mounted versions exist too. So, Forerunner Warthog? And that does it for this week. Damn, that was a ton, a ton of new info, all of it very much welcome. A big thank you to Jeff Easterling and special guest Kenneth Peters for their insight. Keep it up, gents. Before we end today, I have a couple shoutouts. First is to the YouTuber Sci-Fi Gamer, who is giving away a year of Xbox Live membership. Click the annotation on the screen or check the description box for the link to the video and how to enter. The second shoutout is to a channel called JKP Rising. I was recently featured on their FFA podcast, so go check it out. It's basically a bunch of Halo nerds geeking out, but fair warning, the discussions do get 18 plus at a couple points, so. Anyway, that's all for today. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.